This is EDST 1100U, uh, Problem and Inquiry-Based Learning. And this is session 6.0 or session-6-0, uh, intended to be an interview where Jessica and I will be actually discussing um, a series of questions that we think are pertinent or that are milling around in your heads as you get to this point in the uh, the course itself. The first question, um, how does the structure of the, the course itself, so I'm here, I'm referring to uh, the structure of a an FLLC, so fully online learning community type environment. So using the model, the FLLC model, and for those of you who haven't seen that model yet, um, I will provide the links to um, to the model under the uh, in, in the discussion, or sorry, under the comments uh, under the video itself. Um, so I'll add the FOLC uh, link there. Um, anyways, how does the structure of the course? relate to the building of problem-based learning objects? In other words, what's the relationship between the two? Um, so if you wouldn't mind, Jess, could you start talking a little bit about, uh, because you were involved on the ground floor um, with the development of the fully online learning community model, what is the conception behind the digital space? We'll start there. Awesome. So looking at the digital space within the FLC is essentially providing the context or the, the sandbox, if you will, a little bit, the digital environment where learning takes place. So when we talk about the digital space that we're using within this class, we have a lot of different technologies available to us. Um, people are using Slack to communicate knowledge form to communicate. Um, Discord, you mean, not Slack. Discord, that is what I mean. <laughs> um, all of these different tools to have these conversations um, about the course, about their learning, about ideas and perspectives and how they change throughout. So um, we're not limited to only have conversations in one manner. We're able to kind of go about it in different ways. Yeah, there's another aspect too that I think needs to be uh, uh, identified. So the the digital space is actually, along with all of the other parts of the FOLC, uh, the digital space is designed to be co-created. In other words, we are working with you uh, to actually develop this particular environment. So out of all of the, um, the applications that you've uh, uh, seen so far, um, you'll probably also in your small teams be using other kinds of technologies. Some of you will use Discord, which is fine. Uh, all of these are fine, by the way. Uh, but some of you actually uh, are probably using things like WhatsApp um, and, and who knows whatever other technologies that you actually may uh, use to communicate with uh, each other. Um, have you come across uh, people using other kinds of uh, apps that we haven't talked about yet or haven't mentioned? No, I think WhatsApp is another really strong um, tool that people are using that you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the idea is that you bring uh, technologies or tools with you that are going to be helpful for you to actually address the tasks the uh, the work that you have ahead of you. So using uh, the tools that you're familiar with that are, are a good match to the actual um, task that you have in hand. Uh, keep in mind that uh, there are tools that are better match for the tasks than others. Um, I like to use an example of a word processor. I don't know how many of you know this, but you can use a word processor such as Word or Google Docs, um, and you can actually put a table together. That table can be programmed in such a way that it can actually do calculations. So it can be updated fairly easily by changing the data, 
put in your calculations in, it'll actually spit out an answer right there on the page so that it, it becomes dynamic. The problem is that to get that table to actually do those calculations is a lot of work. So if you want to have a table with calculations, so um, columns and rows of numbers that um, can actually be calculated to give you answers, uh, all those kinds of pieces, use a technology that is more appropriate for that. In other words, move, move over to Google Sheets or to Excel or some other um, spreadsheet kind of software that is designed specifically to do that kind of work. Uh, using a word processor for that kind of purpose, while you can do it, it takes a lot more work to be able to do it. So here, here's the, the rationale for why we actually make use of uh, technologies like Google Meet. You can produce, and, and this is trying to be a segue to the next uh, section of the FOLC model, you can actually present yourself as a human being, i.e. social presence, using text. But think about this, text is only words and even if you're using your own slang language, et cetera, uh, it needs to be understood by everybody else. And not only that, but because you're only using text, you are going to be missing out on the incorporation of when you're smiling, when you're pulling a gag on your, your, uh, your friends or, or their, your colleagues that you're working with, when you really mean something strongly, um, all of those things become more and more difficult to actually uh, convey uh, in text language. So why wouldn't you use a more appropriate uh, tool like Google Meet or Zoom or, uh, I hesitate to say Teams, is, is that a better? <laughs> Anyways, uh, that's my own bias, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, can you think of another example where people are inappropriately using or are using a tool that could better be replaced with something that is better? I think we saw this with the content mapping at the beginning of the semester where CMAP wow. was the tool that we had recommended because there are tons of opportunities to change locations of where you wanted the bubbles to explain the relationships between the concepts and really build something that represented your schematic network of learning. Um, and I think trying to apply Canva or anything like that, you're using a tool that's a little bit limited in that sense. Um, I think there's a lot of anxiety and stress that comes with digital space and learning new tools. And um, I think that's what is really excited about that co-creation piece that you feel that sense of ownership once you've used a tool that you've used for the first time or you're trying out a new object. And I think that's a really critical skill that um, can be a little stressful to develop, but is so needed. Um, in education and specifically this course. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, good, good example. Um, can we move to social presence a little bit more specifically? So what is social presence and what are we trying to do in it in, in FOLC type environments? Yeah, so social presence, social presence to me is the tongue twister of the day. Um, but it is the relationship that you're having with other individuals within the space. So um, social presence within an FOLC is looking at having those authentic conversations, um, having your webcams on, which I think is something that you hear a little bit in the classes, but being able to actually engage with someone face to face in an online environment is incredibly important to the social dynamic um, and the relationship building that you're able to achieve. Um, being able to see individuals reactions, um, hear changes in their voices, all of those are what is needed in physical face-to-face -face conversations. And in an online space, you're still having those face-to-face -face conversations. You're just physically 
located in different spaces. Um, so being able to um, create a concept of community, um, be able to have conversations with people, feel that brave and space, brave and safe space, which um, I'm sure you have all heard in other classes, but being able to have that trust with each other is, is very important in social presence. Right. Okay. So we've got digital space. We've talked about social presence. Um, what happens in cognitive presence? Headaches happen in cognitive presence. So um, being able to challenge and critically think about scenarios and situations, I think that criticality is so important when it comes to cognitive space. You're able to um, come in with one idea and have it challenged um, or challenge other people's concepts or their perspectives on things. So this happens quite often um, when you're engaging in debates with individuals or you're having conversations about um, everything. This happens with politics, with life, with every single element. Um, when you're engaging in conversation consciously and critically, you're going to be kind of um, challenging each other to to think about what you're thinking. That metacognition piece is very important. Yeah, so to summarize, I, I, I think one of the ways that we can think about social presence is showing yourself or displaying yourself, presenting is the terminology, uh, presenting yourself as a human being. In other words, a human being, not only with the ability to communicate, but also with the ability to actually have ethical interactions with each other. Um, and leading to that trust thing that, that um, Jessica was talking about before, providing security for other individuals, et cetera. On the cognitive side, you're presenting yourself as a thinking being, all right? Which means that you have to have flexibility. You have to have the ability to listen to the arguments of others, to be able to actually incorporate them into your own thinking, um, built around the whole understandings that you've actually uh, accumulated from your past experiences, making sense out of your past experiences, et cetera. But you also want to actually take those ideas and be able to actually express them back to other individuals via social presence, but take those ideas and provide them with critical feedback. So in other words, uh, ideas that will make their thinking better. So while they're helping you make your thinking better, you're going to be helping them making their thinking better, right? So social presence is all about a human being, cognitive presence all about thinking. All right, so where does the rubber hit the road in terms of collaborative learning, the center of the model? Can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, I can try to. So this is, a thousand percent where you see all of those pieces working together to establish a space that is conductive to the co-construction of knowledge or constructing one's knowledge. So um, I think the big piece here is that we're doing this together as that collaboration versus um, a making those cooperative decisions where we just, okay, agree to this one statement. We're helping each other, we're developing um, a shared understanding of information and constructing our own perspectives. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm just going to, oh, and where do PBLO fit into all of that? into the like the relationship oh, okay so with the pdlos um you have the opportunity to engage in and then provide an opportunity for others to engage in collaborative learning um so it's a little twofold where you're doing it and then are providing that opportunity for others to participate in it too yeah 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 um it, one of the things that that uh may not be clear is this whole idea of 
why are we actually using this kind of methodology and why do we think that it's actually um, uh, an appropriate way uh, to learn about different kinds of things. And this talks about the role of community. Um, so there's a couple of different de definitions that we're actually using with respect to community in the uh, fully online learning community model. Uh, so it's all about community. Uh, the first one is a, um, a definition that comes from communities of practice, which was uh, originally produced by Wenger and Lave. Um, and now they've got uh, uh, another person by the name of Trainor uh, in, into the mix. But the whole idea there is that a community is defined as uh, an, a, a number of individuals who are working together for a common aim or goal. But I think a community is even further than that because it's definitely human. Um, and so I'm going to uh, read you a small little segment out of an article, and I'll give you the link to the article. Um, so this is by uh, three authors, uh, Trinick, Swanson, and Kapoor, and it's found in um, uh, to the Instructional Science in 2018. Uh, so this is volume 46 and it's available through the library that you can actually get there. I'll give you the link to Instructional Science um in the uh, comments underneath this video as well anyways um so uh, the approach that was taken in this article is uh, taken from Vygotskyan scholarship so in other words it's talking about social constructivism the use of our experiences to generate new meanings or new understandings that Jess was talking about in collaborative learning and um they make specific reference to an author by the name of Derek Melser in a, an article called The Act of Thinking. Um, and uh, moving from Meltzer's um, work, uh, in which he actually argues that the human drive to learn, so human desire to learn is the way that I would approach that, or to teach. So looking at it from both sides of that coin, is better understood as a drive. So it's not to learn specific things, but according to Meltzer, it's a drive to act in concert with others. In other words, you want to work with others. You want to be with others. You want to be a social being. Humans are social beings at their root, right? So that, that drive to learn or teach is better understood as a drive to act in concert with others. First, synchronously, in other words, in real time, as we are doing here, but you can also do in a physical environment. And then asynchronously, in other words, sting each other or writing each other or writing articles that are later read by others and responded to by others. Right, so that's an asynchronous thing. Um, a child sees, and here's an elaboration, a child sees members of the community engaged in a shared activity, and that child desires to become part of the activity. Let me help you. Let me join in, that kind of thing. In turn, learning happens. Therefore, learning is subsumed by and is subordinate to communal belonging. In other words, the belonging comes first and the learning comes afterwards. So in other words, what are we trying to do in an FLC environment? We're trying to get you to belong. And once you belong, you'll be learning as a consequence. I, I, when I first came across that article, I thought, yes, there it is. <laughs> it's all about human beings and how human beings get together. Uh, want to comment on that before we go on to the next question? Um, I really like that definition and the article in general is very well written when it comes to different types of communities and how they're functioning within um, within or I guess functioning outside of a traditional higher education environment. So being able to see these communities um, within the scope of other places, I think 
is really helpful to the understanding of learning and how it can happen outside of formalized institutions. Okay, so let's go uh, on and, and use that term, that, that idea that we just expanded here and talk about um, how, yeah, we, Jess and I have been starting to go through your proposals, your, um, your, your description of the setting or context uh, within which you're actually going to be placing your PBLO uh, videos. Um, and, and we've been noticing that there is a lot of attempt to control, which is very much a behaviorist kinds of thing, right? Behaviorism is all about what kinds of uh, actions are you seeing on the parts of individuals, which ones are acceptable, which ones are not acceptable, and then trying to move the acceptable ones, uh, unacceptable ones to become acceptable. Um, but very much it's power uh, that you're exerting to be able to actually control other people's uh, actions. Notice that you're talking about their actions. Behaviorism is all about, and if you go back to Skinner and you go back to uh, the Russians, uh, et cetera, it's all about the behaviors, not about the thinking. The thinking does not necessarily follow the behavior. Think about all the actors that you've ever seen on television or in the movies. Do they actually think the way that they're acting on the screen? I don't think so. If they're not very good actors, perhaps they only can act as themselves, at, at which point maybe, yeah, they are probably um, believing what they're actually uh, doing and seeing. But good actors, uh, I don't think they necessarily believe what they're actually portraying on the screen at all. Anyways, so the question is really, how does control, um, so what we're trying to do, uh, what we're seeing in a lot of the proposals or the uh, descriptions that, that uh, you've submitted, how does that fit within an orientation? So I'm talking about the FOLC type of environment here. And the FOLC is all about equity, diversity and inclusivity, um, how, how do those two match with each other? Uh, and Jess, I think this is absolutely wonderful because I think you're very nicely situated to be able to actually respond to this. <laughs> um, so yeah, when we look at equity, diversity, inclusion or EDI, um, we're looking at what happens with control, who has power, how they're inflicting it on others, and what the responses are. And um, just because it's at the top of my head, and I do not expect anyone to go down the Foucault route, but there's tons of conversations and um, debates about power and power structures and what that means. And when we look at a traditional school setting, we tend to see the power being held by the professor by the teacher, by the sage on the stage that we've talked about. By the curriculum. By the curriculum, absolutely. Um, and so that power is not in the hands of the learners. Um, they're not responsible for what they're learning. They don't have a say in what they're learning. They don't have to get the opportunity to involve themselves in that learning. So um, traditional power structures are just built to ensure that those who are in power stay in power. Um, and that might not be the overt goal of a traditional education system, but that could be the consequence that's happening. So when it comes to ensuring that we have equity, that we um, are able to have an inclusive community, we want to make sure that the power is um, distributed amongst everyone. So that's where you see the lack of that like teacher's voice or that directive saying, this is what I want you to learn and this is how I want you to learn it. This is the problem as I see it. And um, removing yourself from that way of thinking is going to help you out immensely when it comes to looking at the world through an EDI lens. 
if you're saying, here's the situation as I see it, and that's the only way I'm going to look at it, or that's the way that I think is the most important, you're shutting the door to everyone else's perspectives. Um, And that's where, when we talk about your scenarios, when you're presenting your scenarios, coming at it through an ambiguous lens allows everyone else to look at that and say what they are seeing based on their experiences, based on their privileges or lack thereof, based on their um, every single experience that has happened to them to that point, they're going to bring something different to the table. All right. So that leads us to our third question, which is the whole idea of how can you ensure that the expectations that you're you're trying to meet in your problem-based learning objects are actually going to be uh, met by the learners. In other words, how do you ensure that what the learners are learning are the proper ones, the correct ones, the right ones? Let's go back to that language again. <laughs> um, yeah. And the is... answer is? You well, can't. Uh, yeah, so, so let's look at it from the perspective of traditional uh, education. So how does traditional education, you know, as we've all experienced it, with the teacher telling us things, uh, writing notes, we p- take notes in the class, um, and then we take get an, a test or an exam or both uh, in certain kinds of instances. What's trying to, what what's actually occurring there and what's, what, what, what's the basis of the, the processes that are actually being used? So I think when we're going down the route of like, this is important to me, so I want you to learn it, or this is the lesson that you need to learn. This is the specific pathway that I want you to take is not providing that individual you're not affording them an opportunity to construct their own meaning or their own learning you're taking that away from them so it's easier to do that it's easier to say this is i want you to learn this this way da 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 um but it it's you're almost robbing them of that experience if i want to go so far that direction. Yeah, so it actually, I, I would suggest that the results of tests or exams become an illusion that they are mm-hmm. actually learning what you, uh, what the expectations were. Um, in the sense that if you take a look at what a, a person has done, who, who's done an exam or a test very, very well, um, what does an 80%, we'll just grab a, 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 a grade out of the air. What does 80% actually mean? Well, it could mean that they got 80 questions correct on a, uh, a test that has 100 questions. All right, so they chose the right answer, if you want, if it's multiple choice. Or it could mean that they have learned 80% of the material in the way that the teacher or the curriculum uh, outlines. Or it could mean that they ended up guessing 80% of the right answers, assuming there are right answers. Uh, Or it could mean, and and you see where I'm going here? You don't know what it means. Um, It's very possible uh if you take a look at many uh, multiple choice tests and questions etc it's very possible if they are not well constructed that you could end up with a misleading understanding of what's actually happening uh at the end of this discussion though you will always get to the point of i don't know what was learned by the learners in any of these instances. So traditional education 
doesn't give you any more assurance. Just because they ended up with a, uh, a, a very good response on their, uh, I've got a problem with my recording here. Anyways, just because they've got a very good response on their, um, on their test results or, or something along those lines does not mean that they understand what uh, was actually happening within the discussion or the course or whatever else. Um, it, it, it could be that they have their own understanding that is similar to the kind of understanding that was being discussed. But um, uh, at the end of the day, there's no more assurance moving in that kind of direction than there is in any other kind of direction. Now, that's a scary thought from the perspective that do you want to have somebody uh, working on your car who didn't pass their exams in automotive mechanics or something along those lines? And the answer would be probably not. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, I would suggest that someone who does really, really well, for instance, if you had a person who was scoring 90% um, in uh, their exams, and there are exams similar to this, um, to be a family practitioner, uh, uh, a doctor who's going to look after your health, um, I would suggest that you probably don't want that person being your family doctor. And why not? Because the questions are oriented in such a way that they're a better researcher than they are actually a family doctor. Because the questions will be all about research and being able to diagnose appropriately and all those kind of things that you want your family doctor to do. But what else do you want your family doctor to do? To be able to talk to you to find out what your concerns are and to be able to actually tell you what they are seeing in terms of test results, et cetera, that are going to be important for your health. They have to actually establish trust, et cetera. The person who does really, really well on exams may not have those kinds of skills because that's not part of the exam. Right? So uh, do you have any assurance either direction in terms of... Uh, uh, what's being learned in traditional? Nope. So what about uh, problem-based learning? Well, there's actually an opportunity in problem-based learning. I'm not going to, by the way, say that it's better than traditional learning. It's just different because the orientation is designed to work at the community level so that you're working with others, trying to establish understanding under, uh, and new meanings and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you're also moving in the direction of being able to address uh, vital questions or problems that you're seeing in front of you. So things that are going to be pertinent to your own lives, you're engaged, you're going to be motivated, et cetera. Um, a final question or comment or two from, from you, uh, Jess, before we actually wrap this, uh, this video up. I don't think so. <laughs> None at all. All right. Not too long. <laughs> it, yeah. So this has been fairly philosophically oriented, but this is where you end up when you start talking about teaching and learning. Um, I, I, I think one of the things that we have to get around is this, uh, and I meant to talk about this earlier, but I forgot about it. Um, the the relationship between teaching and learning. So in other words, what is the relationship between what is being taught by an individual or from a book or whatever a video or whatever you want to use and what is actually being learned? So the relationship between those two things. Society in general assumes that what is being taught is what is being learned. That's a one-to-one -one relationship. It's positively oriented to correlation. I'm trying to tell you that that particular relationship is fraught with all kinds of diff difficulties, all kinds of nuances, um, and it's not one-to-one. -one. 
we have no idea unless we actually talk specifically to individuals and we ask them questions and they have to be honest with their answers as well and how many many of us are actually honest with anybody except maybe ourselves but even then some of us try, try to fool ourselves as well um so it is really 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 difficult to actually figure out what has been learned by individuals uh at any given time regardless of what kind of methodology you're using uh, i'm suggesting that pbl gives you as good if not better and i i'm going to swallow the better because i can't prove it uh, besides there's no such thing as proof anyways um, there is evidence however that people end up being transformed by their experiences within this class within this course um, can you tell just a little bit perhaps about the kinds of things that you've seen um jess in, in terms of your own uh experiences but perhaps uh about the experiences of others as well yeah i think that that transformative piece is so important because um when you look at just the notion of coming from a traditional system where that one-on-one -on -one perspective is supposed to happen and you're supposed to learn what you're told and then you're told no way you can explore things you can make mistakes you can and I'm now getting into the magic school bus quote of miss frizzle get messy explore make mistakes whatever she says but it's allowing you to have that freedom which is really cool and allowing you to take ownership in your own learning and have that um that transformation from being someone who's passive potentially in your learning to having control of what you're learning how you are learning it and to be able to question things and that criticality is so needed today i think more than ever we're missing that criticality sometimes so um i think we see those transformations quite often in this class where students will come in as i want a grade i want this grade i want to get an a i want you to tell me what to learn i want you to tell me what pages to learn i'm going to memorize this to leaving the class as this really free thinker who's able to look at situations and then uplift others to do the same to challenge other individuals too or to invite them to challenge even more individuals so i think that's the really cool piece all right thank you uh i think we'll wrap it up there uh we'll get one have one more opportunity for this kind of interaction about uh, course materials um, later on in the course in three weeks time um, and uh, maybe we can deal with just pragmatic things at that point in time rather than philosophical I suspect not no. but, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it'll be actually a good experience to have uh, one of these thank you very much Jessica for uh, your willingness to participate in uh, this open flowing kind of piece, even though we had the, the question sort of set ahead of time. Um, but it's kind of neat to actually be able to do this again, uh, more than a decade on from the first time that we actually did that. <laughs> And it's kind of interesting. They they have morphed a little bit. Uh, the conversation has morphed a little bit, but to a large extent, it's actually still the same, sort of, kind of. All right, thank you, and we'll take it from there.